This video is going to consider the fifth syllabus outcome in the preliminary HSC design technology syllabus, which is 4.1. Uses design processes in the development or a student uses design processes in the development and production of design solutions to meet identified needs and opportunities. So if we look at the dot points for that syllabus, we have project analysis, which is, includes design briefs, appropriateness of, appropriateness of design solutions, criteria for evaluation, and factors to consider. And we have marketing and market research, purpose of market research, the sources of data and for informa information gathering techniques, marketing environment, we have dot points on formulate and analyze design briefs, identify the parameters of design, identify criteria for success, uh, produce functionally and aesthetically appropriate uh, design projects and conduct market research to identify needs and opportunities. Okay, so if we go from to the um, Wesley book, we have these following headings, formulating and analyzing design briefs, identifying parameters and criteria for design, producing functionally and aesthetic pro uh, appropriate design projects, identifying needs and opportunities with market research. And then I have review questions below. Okay, so if I start off at the top, we are going to go with formulating and analyzing design briefs. Now I've said uh, in previous recordings where the first step of any design project and really I would say many pro processes, we really want to start with the goals. We want to think about what are the things that we intend to produce at the end of this? What is, going to, what is the success going to look like? And how are we going to evaluate if something's going to be a success? And I try to even go into things like meetings with this attitude where I ask, what do we want to get out of this and how are we going to know whether or not it's a success? The design brief, brief is a document that, well, I'll just read from him. A design brief will help you to ensure that your project achieves all its goals and overcomes its challenges and limitations in order to give you the best chance of success. A design brief can be an important legal document, but even when designing for yourself, it can be a useful tool in identifying the essential requirements of your project. So often the design brief may form part of a contract where you say that this is the things we expect you to deliver and these are the goals that you need to do. But even without that, even if you're just doing this on your own, sitting down and thinking about the things that your project needs to do can be really useful in identifying what you need to do and how you don't know whether or not something's done well. A design brief will also consider the target market. For instance, the um, what that means is the population of the, proj the project will be designed for and marketed to, or the section of the population. Um, so this could be considering things like age, gender, uh, profession, location, like so geographic location, um, or interest groups, people who are interested in certain hobbies. There are many other factors as well, but they're the they're key ones. The market research will also consider existing solutions already available. Let's make that a little bit small. Oh, that's what I'm going to do is make that bigger that way. Okay. So the next chapter is identifying the parameters and the criteria for, of design. So parameters can mean a variety of things in a variety of contexts. In here, what we're gonna use is that when we come up with our design brief, we're gonna come up with the requirements, the limitations and constraints of a project. Now I would say requirements are, what are the things your, your product must do in order for it to fulfill its essential functions? What it must do to, to fulfill its aesthetic requirements? So what does it need to look like? What does it need to do? What sort of properties does it need to have? When we talk about limitations and constraints, I would say these are things that are imposed from the outside. Now sometimes these two things, that they can be nebulous, they can be an overlap, but the idea of limitations, limitations, the most obvious ones are time and money legal requirements, safety requirements. Uh, they're the main things that we think about, but we often have limitations on our skills, on our resources are limitations. Constraints, things that um, that set, a, uh, constraints and limits, I, I, I would struggle to actually differentiate, but um, the idea is that we wanna try and identify all the things we want our project to, to be when it's finished and all the things that are going to um, restrict, our op uh, restrict our possibilities. Now, a good design brief will identify only the parameters that are essential and ignore the features or parameters that are common but which may limit your design thinking. The task activity we did previously was we considered the racing snail. The reason I, I like the racing snail's activity is it encourages people to think about, when we think about personalized transport, we often have an expectation. We think of cars and a car should have four wheels and have an engine and it should have a steering wheel. Whereas when we stop and think about, well, 
and and this is the techniques that I want you to try and think about I want you to try and build your creativity through these processes is if we say what if it didn't do this could you imagine a car that didn't have an engine could you imagine a car or a transport device would it maybe it wouldn't be called a car maybe by definition it's no longer a car but could you imagine a form of transportation that didn't have wheels and then you might say well a boat is a form of transportation that doesn't have wheels and so okay I want to get from my house to the school and I'm going to get there without a, a, an object with wheels what would that look like if you go into your design with the expectation that your car is going to have four wheels you might be excluding other better solutions solutions that are only just re just recently becoming available that don't rely on those same considerations. The easy example here is is engines. So a, a internal combustion engine that runs on petrol has been the mainstay of personal transport vehicles for the last hundred years. However, um, going forward, Tesla with their uh, electric cars, they don't have a petrol engine, instead they have an electric motor. So just there we have an example of the concept that a car needs to run on petrol is, no, that's common, but it's not an essential feature. And that when going through the process of a personal vehicle, which I will give you a heads up, it's gonna be one of the review questions, identify prior requirements, that we might consider things like a requirement is that it must be safe. It must be efficient, which means that it can go at 60 kilometers to 100 kilometers an hour. It needs to um, not consume too much fuel. It needs to be cheap enough to run. So they're all as aspects of efficiency. It needs to be aesthetically pleasing. People don't want to drive things that look like a box. Um, it has to be comfortable. It has to fit the passengers. These are That's just an easy five, um, five features that we require. And this was an activity that we did in class previously. Okay, so... Um, now, there's probably, if I had said the key to this whole topic that I've just talked about, I would say that is the key, is that when you do your design brief, make sure you identify all the requirements that are essential and none that are not. Identify the parameters and criteria for design. Okay. Sorry, I, I've already said that. I don't know why I, sl I slid up. Um, okay. Limitations and constraints are the factors imposed on your, uh, on your design or production. This could incl include time, legislation, or your lack of skills or resources. It is important to identify how you will assess how well you addressed, how well you have addressed each parameter. Assessment is an important way to identify the um, areas, areas of improvement. So when we assess what we've done, we wanna look and say, could we have done that better? Was that the right choice? Maybe it's not too late. Maybe we can go back and change it, or maybe we can make sure that we do, do better in our future projects. Your folios will need to include a section detailing your criteria for evaluation. So in the start of your folios, you're gonna to need to have a criteria for evaluation. Some of the criteria will be more important than others. For example, legal, uh, well, others such as well, others such as legal requirements might be essential. Your criteria will differ from from those of other designers for the same project. Okay, so an example might be that you might do a criteria for evaluation of a movie. So the way that you assess a movie might be very different to how other people assess a movie. I have an uncle and he says that a good movie has to have a car chase in it. He allows Star Wars because he says the uh, the TIE fighter scene at the end is, is close to a, a car chase, so that, 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 that works. Different people have different criteria for movies. People might say, well, for me, a movie has to touch me emotionally. It has to be heartwarming or it has to, to make me cry or it has to, to make me feel something. I would argue that um, when it comes to movies, that it is important that a horror, a, a, often there is an essential criteria where, yes, okay, it needs to meet legal requirements. It needs to do a whole bunch of functional things like it needs to be able to be projected onto a projector and it can't go for more than 90, it can't go for more than two and a half hours uh, and probably not less than 80 minutes. Uh, in order for it to be considered a movie, it has to meet certain cost restraints. But I would say for me, the essential component of a movie is that a movie is supposed to make me feel something, it's supposed to make me, a, 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 supposed to evoke an emotional response. That would be what I would say is an essential component of movies. So the idea is that an action movie is supposed to make me feel I feel exhilarated. A horror movie is supposed to make me feel scared. A comedy is supposed to make me laugh. A drama is supposed to make me um, 
feel either a heartwarming sense or a, a, a sense of um, uh, sadness or something like that. Now, you might argue that a documentary could be very effective without making me feel those things at all. It could just present a very clinical set of facts about the life of a famous person uh, without in any way making me feel exhilarated or um, a sense of laughter or sadness. But I would argue that that's typically not going to make for a very good movie and that a movie will, a documentarian will often try to find those elements where they can in order to keep, to maintain uh, engagement. So that would be what I would say is the essential requirement. So I t take board game reviews um, somewhat ser seriously and I remember a very, probably the most influential board game reviewer, a guy called Tom Vassell, saying that he doesn't like the idea of assessment rubrics because for him the only thing that really matters is how fun is the game and that enjoyment, how, how fun the game is, even though that's very subjective, he thinks that enjoyment should be at least 50% of the criteria. Other criteria such as board art or components um, really have to make up less than half the half of the half of the marking criteria. Um, another one which might be interesting for you guys, because you're students and this is part of your day to day experience, is evaluating a teacher's success. So, and this relates to me because I am a teacher. That when I I think that evaluating a teacher is very difficult. So I've talked in the past about how. Um, in class that uh, I have a friend who started but we both left industry at the same time uh, he came from PR but we both left industry at the same time and we became teachers I remember meeting up about a year after we'd started teaching and asking about whether or not teachers should get more pay depending on if they're a better or worse teacher and he said nope and I said you mean to say we can send a man to the moon but we can't figure out whether or not someone's a good teacher and so we could but we couldn't do it effectively we couldn't do it in a way that was fair and ethical and uh, um, effective and I tend to agree with that, but nevertheless, I think that there's still room for personal reflection and individual levels. We can assess whether or not someone's uh, um, being an effective teacher. Um, in this case, I would say that we have obviously legal requirements. A, a good teacher must meet the requirements, the, the code of conduct uh, for, for teachers in that region that they or for that employer. They need to meet the legal requirements. These are just the baselines. These are the things that a good teacher probably wants to have a standard of heat, a hygiene that is um, it meets a, a bare minimum. But those uh, are so easily established that they're, they're probably not worth going into a huge lot of a huge amount of detail. We just say that these things are essential baselines. Now, an other more interesting criteria that we could have for our evaluation of teachers is we could have things like exam results whether or not the class is entertaining or engaging or fun, or whether or not students have actually learnt anything. Now, if I assess which of these three is most important, there'd be different people who'd give very different results. A principal might only be interested, in this case, the current principal at our school is, um, I, don't, I think is very interested in the success of students in the long term, so their lifetime success, whether or not we're preparing students to be productive members of society. Whereas teachers at other schools might be very interested in just simple academic results, that the effectiveness of a teacher can be summed up by the numbers that they get. And that might not be a very fair reflection on the, whether or not the teacher was effective. Maybe we can use more advanced techniques where we say, this is what the teacher, this is what similar teachers have got, and this is how the teacher is used, you know, taking into account the ability of the students and um, manipulating the data to be more effective. Uh, but what is much more difficult to assess is whether or not students have learnt anything. And that was, I, I would argue that many teachers would be say, would say that it doesn't really matter if the students have fun, it doesn't really matter if the students do well on tests, and what matters is the students have actually learnt something. That said, there would be parents who would dispute that and say, look, I just want, I just want a, a, my students to show up to class. And the best, in different schools, I, if I get them to go to school at all, that was a success. So. The point there is that different people have different criteria criteria for evaluation. I should point out that criteria is the plural, criterion is the singular, but we very rarely use the singular criterion. And I would try to, to restructure your sentences to avoid having to have that um, that phrase. So criteria for excess is really uh, is really important. It's a central part of your folios. You're going to need to include it and start using simple examples now to think about how you assess whether or not something is good or bad. Um, Okay, so producing functionally and aesthetic appropriate design projects. 
In this subject, you're gonna produce design projects. You're gonna produce two formal projects in year 11 and a major project in year 12. Before we start our projects in um, our, our first formal project, we will do at least one task, and maybe two tasks to help you go through this procedure. Um, and we'll probably do at least one of those two will be a group project. That will be the, um, the well-being project. So that, that way we're providing with an opportunity to work as a group and to go through the practice before we start getting assessed on things, go through the process of establishing a criteria, going through the design, design brief. Um, okay, the criteria we set in our design brief can be characterized as functional or aesthetic. Functional criteria consider physical properties such as durability, power, or, um, or application. For example, if we keep making a hard drive, we might think the function's functional criteria might be how much it can store, how quick the read or write speed is. But we also need to know that it's going to last a long time. We're going to, you know, is it using a lot of uh, electricity? Is it going to, what's its energy consumption going to be? Aesthetic considerations are subjective. Uh, they have to do with the senses. So the feel of something, the look of something, and potentially the smell and the sound of something. Now, in the case of a hard drive, the sound and the smell probably aren't going to be major considerations. But um, it's also worth noting that some criteria can be both, for example, weight and size. Even if we stick with the example of a hard drive, a hard drive that is the weight of a brick and the size of a storage cube so 300 by 300 by 300 millimeters is probably not going to be suitable for most people's needs. However, if you're running a server, if you're running a, an internet server, having a hard drive of that size might be, might be actually smaller than what you need. So um, moving on to our next point, identifying needs and opportunities with market research. So we need to conduct market research. We need to understand what our market, the, the, we need to understand the market and we need to understand what our competitors are producing. So investigating how existing design solutions meet the needs of consumers can identify opportunities. If we look at how well existing solutions are working, we can sometimes find a gap in the market and we can design for that gap. Designers should conduct both primary and secondary research. Primary research involves going directly to the source. This includes things like interviewing, experimenting, collecting, and analyzing statistics. Probably the best, the easiest thing for you to do, and when I do um, design with year nine, I talk about the simplest form of primary research you can do is to conduct a survey. Um, but you might do experimentation with materials or with processes in order to see what is the most effective. Uh, secondary research relies on the data of other, the data and finding of others. For instance, a good place where you could go for information is the Australian Bureau of Statistics or the ABS and other institutions and peer reviewed research may assist you with your project. So for instance, scientific journals. So um, the British Medical Bureau, uh, uh, sorry, the British Medical Journal, the um, BMJ, for instance, is a highly, uh, highly um, respected medical journal. So that might be, if you're doing something to do with health, that might be your, your, um, your source. If you're doing something on well-being, you might go to Beyond Blue or Black Dog Institute. These are organizations which specialize in um, depression research or something along those lines. The whole idea is that there's many, many different places where you can go to where people have already done the work and they've already published the findings. You might also find that when you're doing research on, say, materials, you might say, which paper am I going to use to make my magazine? And you might find that someone has already done a comprehensive uh, research and they say, the best paper to use in this context is this. Or you might say that the best software to use for your video editing is Final Cut Pro versus um, Premiere or um, Vegas Studio. You might, so rather than buying all of those because they're too expensive for you to experiment with yourself, you might just find that the best thing to do is watch a YouTube video where someone talks about the pros and cons and says that the best solution for me is this. Um, market research into products looks at the type of product the comp competition is offering. So what we often do is we can do, we can look at other products that already exist in the space and we can look at how theirs compares to how the different products already compare. When we're looking at this, there's what we call the five P's of marketing. So we have marketing of the product, we have price, we have promotion, we have the place and packaging. So I have asked in the uh, review questions to compare say a MacBook 
or a um, Apple high-end Apple product with a generic uh, Windows PC, uh, Windows laptop. So the first thing we have is the product, what the product looks like, how the product itself is marketed. So this might be the, the shape of the product, this might be the, the physical or aesthetic features of the product, the features of the product. The next thing is price is a key, key consideration. Um, Typically, a high-end product is going to cost more, but the specifics matter there. If we look at something that is, uh, for instance, hard drive storage, if we find that all other factors are equal, we might be able to compare storage space just purely on a price basis. And we might say it's more cost effective for us to go with this this product rather than the other based on a unit price. It's important that we consider we break our price down into the life of the product. So not just the initial purchase price, but also the price of maintaining it, the price of disposal, all those sorts of things. It's also that we compare apples with apples so that if we have uh, a product that is more expensive, but is actually more, uh, it, it contains more product, we have to divide by the unit rate to get the uh, fair comparison. Um, the next one is promotion. So promotion is often what we think of when we think of advertising in terms of the, this could be things like displays, in-store displays. This could be also, uh, and this is probably what most people would think of is terms of video advertising. So either um, videos on YouTube, uh, as ads or ads on television or other other forms of promotion. It might be uh, promotion at a venue. So sometimes you might go to a sporting event or a, a concert or something like that, and you might see a product advertised there. Uh, even product placement can be a form of promotion. Uh, these days in, in the era of Instagram, we have influencers who are promoting your products. We also look at place, the place that the, the thing is stored. So for instance, in um, food sales, it's very important where the product is stored on the shelf. Things that are on very high high positions or low positions are less likely to sell than things that are at eye level. Also, the uh, Gruen, Gruen transfer, the, the Gruen TV shows, they're based on the concept that the design of shopping centers is carefully considered to encourage consumer spending. Uh, packaging is also an important consideration. So. When we, in, just in terms of marketing, in terms of selling a product, getting people to the the extent of the packaging, we might end up spending more on a packet. Sorry. We might spend more on the packaging of a high-end product just to give a better aesthetic feel and so people feel better about spending the larger sums of money. So for instance, this is where an example of Apple products all come in a very um, high quality, very clean and minimalistic white box. If you compare this to other products which might come in just the plastic wrapper that you buy them in or a very, uh, a very flimsy cardboard box with a whole lot of... Um, with less consideration to design because for instance that they may you may not have actually spent much time looking at the laptop in its box so that's where that, that's the five five p's of marketing when we're marketing a product we have to consider our um, internal and external factors what we call the microeconomic and macroeconomic factors internal factors are things that we control so there's things things these things like production methods or con communication but we have six macroeconomic forces that affect our organizations. I'm not gonna go into these in any real detail. Um, I will just show you that they are in the textbook. Okay, there, there's more detail on page 30, sorry, 52. Um, on the macro and economic environment. I'm just gonna um, just uh, identify them. So we have demographic trends. So these are the trends of the group of the people that we're considering, the section of the population we're considering. We have economic trends. So the, te the trend at the moment for housing is that housing is, is prices are falling. 10 years ago, there was a big economic um, downturn, what we call the GFC. Um, but so in five years time, we'll probably see a, um, a economic uptick. There are some products that are better, that are more successful in economic downturns, and there is definitely more products that are, that are successful when there is a high economic growth. 
We have natural and environmental trends. So definitely uh, things like climate change is an increasing concern. So carbon dioxide emissions are more of a concern. Um, we, but also things like social pressures for things like um, consumption of meat or um, forest fires might be, it might be a factor that if I am managing a national park, that might be a consideration that I need to take into account. Uh, we have technological trends. So obviously that we've seen an ever increasing use of technology. Technological trends are going to affect all the success of certain products. Um, ironically, some products buck those trends. So for instance, um, I've already mentioned before, uh, board games at least once in this, in this, this video and um, technological trends have led to my first exposure to modern board games was through the um, Settlers of Catan app on my, when I, my first iPhone and if I hadn't played that I probably wouldn't have got into to modern board games that said there are people who are looking to get away from technology because people are feeling um, people are starting to realize more of at the moment there's a social backlash on technology because people are starting to feel as though there are negative well-being impacts on too much social media. So that's an example of these these trends being somewhat cyclical. Uh, marketing de decisions. So marketing decisions in the global economic force can, can have an effect. So marketing decisions and market market generally general marketing forces. I'll put out as an example that at the moment things like Nike shoes are connected to other other factors in the United States to do with um, I'm going to go with patriotism. If, if you want to look up Nike boycott, um, I'm sure you'll get information, especially if you're listening to this in 2019. But um, marketing decisions can be a, fa a factor in the widest scale that you're competing against other sort of um, advertising that is going to to influence whether or not your product is going to be successful, and cultural trends. So this sort of relates to all of the points that we talked about above. But if we look at clothing, clo clothing goes in cycles. So uh, at certain times, dark colors are going to be more popular or light colors are going to be more popular. Heavy clothing is going to be more popular. So this is not just to do with weather, but this might be to do with um, the influence of bands or the influence of um, athlete, uh, um, athletes or politicians or maybe not politicians. Um, I think I was looking like celebra other celebrities. So for instance, um, a cultural trend is that um, with the popularity of the Kardashians, um, larger butts are more of a more fashionably on trend than they were say 10 years ago as, as just one example. Okay. So the review questions I have here, are identify five requirements for the pass passenger vehicle. If you took notes when we were, um, doing our racing snail uh, explanation, you'll have a good idea there. Uh, we, if you look above, I think, or it's certainly above in the video, I've described at least five. Explain why it's important to only include the essential parameters of design. I said earlier that this is what I think is the key, that if you don't, you're going to exclude good solutions. You're going, it's going to make it harder for you to uh, identify the best possible solutions. Um, it's also important that you do include everything that's essential. I should say this as above, but if you don't include everything that's essential, you might have designers spending time and energy on things that aren't what you wanted. Okay, compare the value of primary versus secondary research. I left this a little open for you, but I'll give you something of the answer to here, which is that often primary research won't cover exactly what you need to, to look at. So you have to go and do, sorry, secondary won't cover exactly what you need. So you need to go and do the primary research yourself. On the other hand, sometimes it, it would be impossible for you to conduct a large scale, scale, a large scale study with 20,000 people. It's just not possible for someone in our, in our situation in a high school level for us to do that. So that's where we have the pros and cons of primary versus secondary. Classify the prior properties of a smartwatch um, as either functional or aesthetic. Um, so you can pick whatever five functions you like, but think about a smartwatch. So for instance, weight, we can talk about as being um, either of those. If a weight, if a watch is too light, it might not feel as though it's um, classy enough. Whereas if it's too heavy, that might be a negative feature. Um, screen size is again, both functional and aesthetic. My smartwatch is much larger than the watch that I had for 10 years beforehand. Um, now that 
is has an advantage, which means I can see more on the screen. But aesthetically, uh, a larger screen may or may not attract uh, attract or detract. Um, I replaced the band on my smartwatch with a stainless steel band to match the the rest of the watch, uh, rather than the leather leather band. Now I did that for functional reasons. It's a lot easier for me to take off and put on. It's a lot more durable, but I also think it looks better. Um, so there's a few criteria there. Provide the, a criteria for evaluation for assessing a movie. Now I talked about this a little bit earlier, but basically what I'm doing, when you do an assessment, you always come up with a, that should be criteria for evaluation. Um, when you do an assessment, we always give you a criteria for, uh, when you do a, an assignment at least, maybe not for a test, we always give you a criteria for evaluation. We tell you how we're going to mark it. And I think I always urge you to use that criteria for evaluation because if you address that criteria for evaluation, the teacher has no choice but to give you the full marks. They can, You can then come back and say, why didn't you give me this mark? I've addressed everything on this criteria for evaluation. So uh, what I want you to do is I want you to choose uh, to come up with your own criteria for evaluation for assessing movies. Or I want you to come up with, as we already talked about, assessing teaching, what, what makes a good teacher. Compare five differences for the marketing of an Apple laptop to a generic Windows laptop. We've already talked about that. And describe the six macro forces that affect organizations. Now, I have given you a very simplistic high-end description, um, but I urge you to read the textbook, the Wesley textbook, because that goes into more detail and it's gonna be more more accurate than what I've said. So uh, for each of those, the word describe is a HSC keyword, which means that rather than just listing them as they are here, which would be identify, you need to give me one sentence on each describing them, identifying key characteristics. Okay, in the next uh, video, I will go through uh, the sixth syllabus outcome for the preliminary course and we'll go through that, thanks.